Hello, hello, Rico. You're back. Yeah. Guess who's back? It's Rico. How you doing, mate? I'll just made me a blueberry shake. You've got you've got a new hat, the IBF hat. Yeah, yeah. I've had to uh, stop wearing my fight, my Dennis Hobson Fight Academy one. Why? I don't know. I might block them this week on WhatsApp. Would you a fall out? <laughs> Keeps him on his toes, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So, but uh, but getting back to uh, let me look at these other things that I've jotted down for us to debate. Now we've had a chat about the zone. Let's finish off on the zone thing. Where, where's the zone heading? Are they on Skid Row? Do you think? Oh, I think I think they're changing, so they'll probably focus more on Europe. So. The US thing will be abandoned in 18 months and then they'll see what they can do in Europe. So that depends on whether they can get Matchroom fully on board in the UK. But if not, I think they might exit boxing in the next 18 months. That's my prediction. They're either going to try something in the UK with Matchroom's roster or then they're going to exit boxing. Boxing's not a good sport to be in because it's just financially, it's very hard to make any money out of boxing because of Fan base isn't big enough. Look at Box Nation. Look at every other sort of boxing only platform that's tried to be made. So PBC, when they launched and had all that money and tried to get their own bouts and you know all of their own stuff, the first the first sort of iteration of PBC just didn't work out. So I think uh, yeah, the zone might leave boxing in eighteen months. That that's my uh, guess. Well, everything I said. How about you? Yeah, well, well, I said it, Ultra Tech Sports Raw said it. Everybody should tune into Ultra Tech Sports Raw and UCTV Boxing. They all said it. And I only said it because, obviously, Dennis knows people in America who are promoters. I'm not going to mention their names. And they know TV people. And let me tell you this. When Eddie Hearn said that Showtime will be going bust inside 12 months, yeah, people who were boxing managers and boxers in America, they started to believe him, so they started signing with him, and it caused a lot of unrest. And let me tell you this: let's come back to bite him in the arse now, isn't it? Because it, it's made it hard for people to to want to work with him, isn't it? When you're coming out with things like that, attacking people. I know I'm I'm not one to talk, but he's actually a lot higher up ladder than me. He's at the top of his game, isn't he? And what he's done. He's unsettled the market, so somebody sent me an email the other day. said, Porky, you've unsettled the market. <clears throat> I said, have I done that, Jonathan? He said, well, you've said that Frank Warren might have sky date. So I said, well, I don't know if Frank Warren's got sky dates, but the fact that Frank Warren actually has had meetings with a big top brass at Sky shows that they might be looking in a different direction, but getting back to unsettling people well that's unsettled a lot of people but it's also had people sign with frank can it because they think that he's going to get something going with sky now i could exactly. be wrong there and i could be off the mark but frank might be going to see sky to talk about fights like fury joshua Dubois white or anthony yard callum smith or yard Boatsy. but either way with the Cold War's got to end for boxing to move forward. Frank Warren and Eddie have put three fights on in 10 years, haven't they? They've got to yeah. put more fights on. Three fights in 10 years? Come on. Yeah, the, the British boxing talent uh, pool isn't deep enough to actually have separate stables that aren't going to make fights between them. You can't even make British title fights that are competitive without that. And if anything, the board should be the first people that should be emphasising this. And the board should also match these guys together more regularly, not just avoid putting Franks and Eddie's fighters together. Yeah. You might be right, Rico, right. Moving on then from this Dazone mess. And in a way, I'm glad Dazone is suffering. And I'm not going to sit here and say... Oh, it's I'm gutted. I just want boxing to, to do well and all that. No, I'm not. I hope Dazon go under. Fuck you, Dazon. Right, what else have we got here? Tyson against Roy Jones. What do we think to that shambles? Two men that have gone bankrupt twice. 
not got a pot to piss in and they're going to fight. Oh, it's just a cash out, like isn't it? Or money. It's just a cash out, isn't it? Just tapping into this when people saw Tyson hitting pads and people actually, and when he's talking about, yeah, and when he's talking about um, comebacks and, you know, beating Tyson Fury, so it's just tapping into that, isn't it? There's nothing else to it. I mean, Roy Jones' last fight were in Russia, and remember when he got beaten by Enzo Macanelli, and then he went and fought against that guy in Russia that, you know, threw the fight, basically. Yeah. That's why it's an exhibition fight, because these guys, if they, they couldn't get licenses because they just couldn't, you know, one of them would get hurt if they were fighting against the younger man. When's the last time Tyson fought? 2000? 2000... 2005. Exactly. Against Patrick McNeely, isn't it? Was it 2004? Something like that, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, he got beat in his last fight. Wait, 04 against, uh, no, not Kevin McBride. Oh, Kevin, yeah, Kevin McBride. That's the guy, the Irish guy. Well, look, they're all saying Mike Tyson's in great shape now. I went to Frotcher's on his birthday, 2nd of, second of July, and he, he looked in fantastic shape, Carl, and, and he, he's under 13 stone. And, but he says he, he's not fight fit. You know, I said, oh, you look in good shape, Carl. He goes, I'm not fight fit, though. You know, he, he still trains and that, but it's, there's a difference between training and, I mean, he still goes on pads and, and from what I've heard, looks the business, but if you ask Mick Whale, he'll say, I look fantastic on pads for one minute. But it's fighting in one minute. It's 36 minutes, isn't it? So. And your body changes, doesn't it? So when you're doing heavy weights, your body shape changes. I remember when Frotter was meant to fight against, um, you know, he was meant to, there's talk about him coming back and he was saying he couldn't come back at 168 just because his body shape has changed. You have to shed muscle. You know, when you get older, right? I mean, obviously, you know, I had a gastric band, don't you, seven years? Yes. And it's only in the last six, seven weeks, obviously, as a gym, I put fracture. I've been training now for six, seven weeks. Do you know when I went to last, was it last week or week before? I went to a place next door to where I used to live in Cunningsborough, back of where, they, where I used to, you, know, you came to my other house, didn't you? Yeah. The lady next door does a sports massage. She does it for leisure centers, gyms, and sports people. I went there 70 minutes over there. Do you know what? I couldn't move for two days after. And and then I started again, and then I, I got injured yesterday morning. And because we're getting older, aren't we? I'm 50, I'm 50 year old in October. Mike Tyson's what is he? 54. And he's, he's like lost that. six stone, hasn't he? And he's got in great shape. But there will, will there be any dope testing? Because in Mike Tyson's book, his autobiography, he admits doping, doesn't he? Roy Jones got busted, didn't he? As well, he did. Will there be any dope tests for this fight? No, there won't. The pro no, of course they won't. That's why it's an exhibition. I mean, Mike Tyson runs a weed farm and he smokes weed on his podcast all the time, so he wouldn't pass it. Out. Exactly, yes. but what I want to say is that Mike. That's the first thing. Look, Mike Tyson and Roy Jones will be on phone to each other trying to sell it and stuff like that. I mean, I've heard stories from people who Dennis knows about what Mike Tyson used to do to try and sell fights and stuff like that. And Roy Jones, they'll be on phone to each other laughing and joking. One's going to be a good guy, one's going to be a bad guy. For example, David A. We all know about David A. and Eddie Earn and Bellew, how they all got their heads together for both fights to narrate a script and who were going to play what part. But the general public don't know that. I know that personally because more than, more than four or five people have told me who know them. And the point I want to make is... You can see which fights have got genuine beef and which ones haven't, can't you? For example, yeah, Scotch Grove. You can do. There will beef there, won't there? Massive beef. Uh, and there isn't that many fights where there's there's proper beef. Dylan White against Joshua the first time, there were beef there, but I don't think there would be in rematch, I think, because the power no. are up, aren't they? Exactly. Uh, and I, I also find it a bit tiring that the boxing narrative is always that there needs to be beef, there needs to be this, people just need to hate each other for it to be an interesting fight. And I don't really, um, you know, I don't subscribe to that. You know, you can have a good fight and you can sell a good fight off the back of fights as being good rather than all the time having... Yeah, yeah, you can, yeah. So... I just think it is two men trying to get a few quid out of their popularity. 
and cashing, taking money off at fans. But let's just keep it as an, an, as an exhibition because it's about money. Now, I just wish some sanctioning body had licensed them so, so then somebody would get into trouble because somebody could get hurt, couldn't they, really? Two men like that fighting at that age. I mean, what next? We're going to have John Fury wheeled out against Mike Tyson. Well, we're going to have a... Or are we going to have uh, Collins against Eubank? Yeah, or Ben. Yeah. Ben against Robbie Sims. <laughs> uh, weapon at week, that's tomorrow. Helmets at month, that's Friday. Kinelo Smith we spoke about. Uh, what's that say? Yeah. Uh, Roundup at weekend's action. Joe Joyce. What did you think to Frankenstein then? You knock that guy out, it's like three round, any third round. Sorry, you just cut out there. Can you what repeat did, that, please? What did you think to Frankenstein, Joe Joyce? He got hit quite a lot. I mean, David Hay said in studio, but he got hit clean uh, in the first round. Yeah. You know, and his style, and he wasn't, he didn't look particularly in good shape. I mean, the guy was there to be knocked out. It wasn't a good performance by any accounts. No. And it doesn't really give me any confidence against Dubois, but again, whether that fight happens this year, time will tell, right? They're not going to do it unless they can have a full crowd and most of the O2 sold out. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about punditry at the moment, Rico? Where do you think it's heading? And do you think that too many of them are basically putting the tongues up people's assholes and not yes not uh, correctly like the football you mean you get graham sooner so slate certain liverpool players and i'm always shocked because we're used to putting it to from sky but do you think that this commentating for the mates and the, being eager to please and all that do you think that's killing sport as well along with along with social media yeah i i think genuinely there is a lack of people that say what they see and also know the game that you need to play to get more of these punditry gigs. And it's really unfortunate because I think it diminishes the TV product. So, you know, at least in football, you might not like Roy Keane or Graham Souness, but they give a different opinion. I'd rather somebody tell me, particularly if I'm new to the sport and I'm not a hardcore fan, if something is shit and the fight isn't good, I'd rather somebody tell me it's not good for these reasons rather than say, oh, he's got a bit of ring rust. You know, it was good. Get the cobwebs off. You know, he's coming off the pandemic because it, it undermines the entire product because what you want to say is when there's a good fight, give it credit. But when there isn't a good fight, tell us it's not a good fight. Yeah. Also, the scoring is another thing because we can all see what our own eyes was winning the fight, more or less, unless it's a close fight. Why, why does the commentary need to emphasise that the house fight is doing better? Because that's where all this robbery stuff always comes, right? Yeah. Do you feel, Rico, that sometimes when it's a matchroom fighter and he's in, a, he's in a fight that he's, he's close, do you feel that fans tend to side with the opponent because matchroom are that hated? And we'd, uh, I, like think it, I think it's... I think it really depends on the fight, before doesn't you, it? Because... Before you answer this, can you before you answer this, can you compare Crawler Linares one, Smith Abraham one, and Callum Smith John Ryder one? Can you compare them and tell me why there should be a rematch in each one? Should Paul Smith have got a rematch in Germany? Um I don't think it was it was a close fight. Smith fought well. Uh, Abraham wasn't on his game, but I don't think it was any more... Do you think they played you know, on the fact that it were in Germany and they knew they'd get shafted on points, so they just went along with that narrative, like Robin Reed? Of, 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 course, they, of course they did, but again, I, I, if it's, a clo it's a close fight, wasn't it? It was a close fight, so however you score that fight, it was a close fight, and every time there's a close fight and it doesn't go your way... You can't cry wolf, can you? You can't say because it's in Germany. Because you accept the fight in Germany. You know what the circumstances are. And the same applies for Britain. If a foreign fighter comes to Britain, they're not going to get a close decision. Did Paul Smith win seven rounds against Abrock first time? No. He won four rounds, didn't he, that rate? I had eight-four. 
I think I had it uh, five uh, seven, but again, a couple of rounds are close. Um, so it doesn't it doesn't matter though. It's a close fight, and Abraham won. So there's no you don't need to call her even. Crawler then. I give Crawler one round and sh a shared one. Somebody I know is a former world champion. Give Crawler two rounds. So how did Crawler get a rematch? Because Joe Gallagher was screaming at front rafters, wasn't he? And it made sense yeah. for them all. Well, it made sense for Linares. I think Linares was happy to oblige because he got paid really well for it. And what about uh, Cal uh, Callum Smith, John Ryder? We had John Ryder winning that, didn't we? 8-4. I did, yes. I, I had John Ryder winning. Uh, again, this whole point about rematch, if it was, uh, if John Ryder was a matchroom fighter and Callum Smith was from another stable, you'd have all the matchroom, the punditry, the promoter, everybody would be calling for a rematch. I mean, the social, social media was calling for a rematch, I was saying it was poor scoring, mm. but nobody from the matchroom team or the Sky team were calling for it because he didn't fit the narrative. So it, you have this unfairness where we're calling for rematches when we want certain outcomes. If the outcome doesn't, isn't what we think it should be, then we don't call for a rematch, neither does the punditry. And that's, that's exactly the problem with the punditry in boxing, isn't it? The punditry is there to suit whoever they want to win. It's not there to tell us what we, what's happening in the ring and what they saw. Yeah. You know, do you, can you imagine someone like Teddy Atlas being a pundit in the UK? I mean, that would be just yeah, mind-blowing. Exactly. Exactly. They got rid of, uh, of Malik Naji, didn't they? Yeah, exactly. Look at uh, Naz when he was the pundit for that Chris Eubank Jr. fight against Groves. Mm. <laughs> You know, he's never been a pundit since because he just said, he said what was on his mind, whether you agree with that or not. That's everybody's prerogative, but at least he said what he thought. Yeah. Yeah, there's, uh, I've heard there's a big shake-up at Sky at moment with pundits. That's what I'm hearing. There's going to be a big shake-up. So we're going to see, but I don't think it'll be a shake-up in favour of hardcore fans. I think it'll be a shake-up in favour of Let's just get people doing pundit work for us that are going to rim us and read the narrative. That's what I way it's heading. So you're going to probably get more people like Johnny Nelson, Darren Barker, Spencer Oliver, Bell you on board. The Malik Narges and other people like that will go against the grain. I don't think there'll be a place for them no more, me. So I don't. No. We got rid of Glenn McCrory for not towing, towing line with narrative. Um, Jim Watt. You know, so, and then you have Anna Woolhouse commenting, who doesn't take any side on anything, right? Anna I mean, how does that how does that serve us to sport, right? If you can't even ask the tough questions, how does that serve us to anybody that's watching it? I don't know, but you've got to understand when you're getting two hundred grand a year or whatever they're getting, it's going to be hard for them to go against the narrative, isn't it? If they've got mortgages. This is why I'm glad you've got people like Roy Keane and Graeme Sooners, who's one of the richest property developers in the country, Graeme Sooners. He's got mega money. He builds houses with like four and 500, you know, on one estate. Yeah. So Graeme Sooners, he ain't going to be bothered, Graeme Sooners. He's just going to say what he wants. He's been there, seen it, done it. He's played in World Cups. He's captained his country. He's won European Cups, titles, played abroad. He's done everything and he managed abroad. So... Sooners, whose opinion I, I respect. I respect Roy Keane as well. Although I do think that he's going out to bat a little bit for Ollie, Olive Gullis Holtzko. And I think he'd be better as a number two at Man United and not a manager. I don't think he's going to take him forward. But we're going to see, innit? We're going to see, aren't they, now they've signed that Hernandez. It looks like they're turning it round. Yeah, I mean, we'll see today where, whether they make the top four. But back to boxing. Uh, if you think, if you think, yeah, I mean, they do go sometimes extreme soonest and Roy Keane. But if Sky weren't, if Sky didn't want that or the fans didn't like that, they wouldn't be pundits, would they? No. So no. if the Sky, if Sky gives somebody that's more against the grain a chance on boxing punditry, at least let the fans decide what they think about it. It's yeah. that simple. You can't just 
not give us an option and say, we just want these type of people in punditry. And they all pro matchroom, aren't they? Yeah. That's why these guys in punditry won't bring up Frank Warren fighters, won't mention what's going on beyond, beyond the realms of the matchroom universe. So fans are being duped on this ignorant stuff, the aren't they? Universe. I like that one, Rico. The matchroom universe. Matchroom FC. <laughs> it's funny that. <laughs> hmm. uh, moving on then, Rico. Uh, where do you see Dennis's stable heading? Cash Alley, Josh Whale, Super Tommy Frank. Where, where, where's Dennis heading? I think they all at that stage of their career that now is probably the time to take rest and see how well they can do. I mean, Cash Alley is somebody that could be in that British level heavyweight mix. Reckon, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, look, he'd be, he he would have beaten David Price if he wasn't being silly. But David Price has got a lot of opportunities. I mean, I'd say he'd beat uh, Dave Allen. So once you have the likes of Dubois and Joyce graduating, uh, probably to levels above, then you might have... Like, Cash Alley would be the perfect opponent for the loser of Dubois against Joyce or someone like Fabian Wardley, or somebody like that for a British title. Would you put Cash Alley in with Dave Allen or Tom Little? Oh, he'd beat them both. Would he beat Dave Allen, yeah? Oh, yeah, I mean, what has Dave Allen shown us that we should believe that he'd beat uh, Cash Alley? So think about, I don't like triangulating. I don't like, tri- yeah. I don't like triangulating in boxing, uh, but just as an example, how did Cash Ali handle himself against David? He, did it, he handled himself better against David. Price. Didn't he? Yeah, him. exactly. So you've got to, just by going on that, I think Cash Ali would be the favourite and probably should be the favourite. Yeah. Yeah, so Tom Little against Dave Allen, who wins that? Well, what... Lessel's best win. I mean, Tom Lessel's not very good, is it? He's basically a part. He's capable, Tom. He's capable. But he hasn't shown it, has he? No, he hasn't shown it. He might show it in ring when he spars and that. I've heard he did all right sparring Joshua and that, but he's got to do it under lights. Hasn't yeah. He? Well, there's so many fighters that are good at sparring, but then they can't translate in the ring, can they? No. Might be mental issues for people like Dave Allen and Tom Little. Maybe they might need to co- come off of social media. Put more I mean, Tom Little. Media. Tom Little has lost his f- uh, last four fights, hasn't he? Has he? Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's ten and eight. Time. Yeah. With ten, with well, a ten and eight record and losing his last four fights, so you probably so a couple of Olympians, aren't he? Yeah, exactly. But that's it. That's his choice, isn't it? Yeah. Do you want to build a career uh, and win some area level and British level titles? Yeah. Or do you want to go in as the B side and with a little chances of winning? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's 2007 yeah. when he lost one of fight, Tom Little. It will work. 2007 was the last time he won a fight. Is that when Tom Little last won a fight, 2007? Yeah, against that Josh Sanderland guy who was in the... 2017 or 7? Sorry, 17. Sorry, 17, 17. Tom Little's three year without a win. Will he not get a, a, a title shot then, will he? At Whitport? No. No. He's only four once for Southern Area title. And he lost that. Could be Dave Allen against Cash Alley then, this... This autumn. Well, Dave's a very expensive guy, isn't it? So he won't he won't do it for. Uh, we'll see whether he continues fighting. Oh, Dave. Yeah. Well, look, Dave's put it about that he's a big ticket seller, and I know he isn't. But he does get people who want to watch him. Does he from social media? Oh, what do you, exactly? So. But now there's no tickets to sell. I mean, you know that Kamil Sokolov. Yeah. Really, Rico. 
Earth calling Rico. Earth calling Rico. <laughs> Rico. Be there, mate, yeah. Rico. Hello, Rico. Right, point I was trying to make, Rico, before it froze is Dave Allen doesn't sell tickets, in my opinion, but there's a there's a myth going around that he does. So now that there's no tickets to sell on these shows, Dave should have took the money from you, shouldn't he? Do you know what I mean? Hang on a minute. There you go. We back. Rico's back. Point I'm trying to make is there's no tickets to sell on these shows, whether Dave does loads of tickets or not, and he ain't a big ticket seller, but he does put bums on seats as regards people watching on TV because Sky would have studied all that. And that's because David's got a funny personality or quirky, whatever you want to call it, and he's a tough kid. But do you think that the novelty's worn off with David now? Because he's not done his sense justice by not keeping fit and... You think he might have yeah, over, I, you think he might have overdone this PR thing a, a little bit too much, do you think? And people have gone, Do you know what? We're on to somebody else now. I don't know. Yeah. I, I think so because the thing is, as much as people like you, right, they want to follow a winner. So you want to back the underdog because they on the road to somewhere. So you can't just trade off a funny personality and lose all the time because people get bored of that. Yeah. Otherwise, you end up being the opponent that's a bit of a clown and a wild case that people sort of, people, people still tune, people will tune in, but they'll tune in for the main guy, not for you. So at the moment, his role is very much an opponent. I've heard the bringing out a Dave Allen doll where you can beat it, kick it, punch it, and it just keeps coming <laughs> forward, moving it. Like, boom, boom, boom. Like that. boom, boom. And that's good. Will they it? have a? Dave will they have Dave a? Dave Allen the movie. Dave Allen the movie. The white will, rhino. I'd go watch it. Will he have? Will he have like a Darren Barker equivalent that just stands there doing nothing? Yeah, Darren Barker, the man that throws towels in. Hmm. <laughs> I don't know, but we wish Dave well, don't we? Yeah. Just move your head a bit, Dave. Move from side to side like Big Porky, like that. That's why you don't get knocked out. Move your head from side to side. We've seen your videos on the punch bag in the in the old house's backyard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Back in the day, well, Steffi Ball says <laughs> our reaching. He says you're reaching. You don't punch like that. I said, well, come round and let's get at it. I'll show you how we reach. <laughs> <then>. <laughs> uh, moving on, then we've got nine minutes left. Moving on. What do you think about Savannah Marshall? Where's she heading at the moment? Uh, she doesn't want a blue tick on her Twitter. And do you think things like that, and Peter Fury not wanting a blue tick, and them not being controversial, do you think, and Yui not being controversial, do you think that might damage them moving forward with Matchroom? No. <laughs> The thing about Savannah Marshall is, right, there's only one fight for her that we really care about. Like, we don't care about the world titles. We don't care about anything but her fighting against Clarissa Shields. So they just need to deliver that fight sooner rather than later um, because we can't follow a career where she's fa she might be winning and being very impressive, but there's only so much interest the fans can have on somebody. What is it? They fought in – they were both in 2012. Is that correct? Both of them. So that's eight years ago. They were both in the Olympics. Surely it's time now, eight, nine years later, if we do it in 2021, to have that fight. And I think that would be a fight that would actually get boxing, you know, people would be really interested in watching more so than watching Katie Taylor fight against anyone. Um, yeah. That could be a headline card on its own right. I don't think it would be pay-per-view because boxing is such a small sport, but it would be a headline on Saturday night, and I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't sort of say that. 
I think it would be a good headline. I'd have nothing. And I think Savannah Marshall's a great professional. She's a real credit to women's boxing, uh, the way how she conducts herself, um, the way how she is in the ring and outside of the ring. So she's exactly the type of role model that you really want in female boxing. But she needs that marquee fight, and there's only one marquee fight for her, because then we know what level she's at. Well, as of yesterday, Savannah's under the 70 pound, and she's fighting for a world title October at 175, but she can do 168 or 160. So yeah. Shields, she needs to stop working her mouth and get into a position where she can say, I'm gonna, I'll fight you, but this weight, and then Savannah will do the weight, and they'll fight. It's not rocket science, yeah. is it? Yeah, I'm not sure what the holdup is because I don't think Shields is gaining millions of dollars. Um, there's a good source of good versus evil narrative there as well. People can get behind Savannah. And if they did it in the UK, I think it would sell, you know, it would sell, it was a good undercard. Yeah. It could sell something like Wembley Arena or something like that. Or even do it in Hartlepool or could Newcastle. Oh, yeah, they, put, they could do it in Hartlepool. Or Newcastle. You could do it in, New, in Newcastle on Ritz, with Ritson on the same card. Do a dual, yeah. dual uh, not well, maybe a dual fight or a dual pay per view at a tenor or something like that. Savannah, she, yeah. Ritson, I'd... and uh, and somebody else. They could do that, and they'll, or everybody pay a tenor for it. They, that'll do. I'd pay for that. You know, I'd pay for that. And you know what? I want I want female boxers to be paid well, and I I want them to be paid, especially when the fights are good. And I think if that helps prop up Savannah's person get Clarissa Shields over, then that would be great. I'd rather have it here than have it in Atlanta in some casino on a Dimitri Salita bill. Atlantic City, you mean, don't you? Yeah, exactly. And then on a Salita bill where the undercard is full of nobodies and there's no atmosphere. No, do you remember him when he fought Amir Khan and jumped on the floor? First round? Oh, yes. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. What it's, do you think? Yeah, I, I, I like Savannah Don. Obviously, I've got to know her the last few years. And I like her. I think she's just really quiet. You know, you can be sat on an aeroplane with her or... In a restaurant, she doesn't say no. I've been sat next to her and Yui for an hour, hour and a half in the upstairs in the gym. Everybody having the tea, and I thought they're not speaking. They're just quiet kids, aren't they? They let the fist do the talking, don't they? Yeah, exactly. And I mean, here, a lot of people have written Hugh Fury off, but he's still a young heavyweight. Uh, and I think he's an example of a guy that takes chances. I don't mind the losses on his record because. 25 He's got a good year record. 25 year old. Yeah. I mean, this is how I look at it, right? Uh, the, there's no, there's no rush for you, is there? No. No rush, but it is what it is. But getting back to Savannah, uh, I said to her, I says, uh, "Why don't you come out on social media and tell Carissa Shields you're going to knock her out?" She says. So I don't want to. I says, will you knock her out? And she give me a smile and she says, we'll see, we'll see. And I says, will you, will you? And she says, we'll see. And she give me that little bit of a confident, you know, nod. And I think that Savannah's one of them people that she prefers to do a talking in the ring. She, she's, she'll tell you she's got her number. And a fighter knows when they've got somebody's number now. She bashed her up before, didn't she? Exactly, she, she did. 18 and the Savannah were 21 or whatever, but she bashed her up. And th and that might have dinted Clarissa's confidence because it's the last fight she had, isn't it? Last loss she had, sorry. Yeah, yeah and the only loss she's ever had, right? Yeah. So, yeah. yes. I mean, Peter Fury says that Savannah hits very hard on the pads, doesn't she? Or doesn't he? I've seen a spa Peter McDonough, she can punch. <laughs> <laughs> but I've seen a spa somebody else as well and uh she she it were it were hard for her. It were hard for her. But you know it's boxing, isn't it? It's not to be played at, is it? If you want to start bar sparring men every now and then they're gonna open up, aren't they? Do yeah. You know I mean? 
if you're going to start throwing them big rights of yours and you're a woman, well, a man's got everybody watching and he don't want to make a mistake, so he might open up on you. But if she can take punches off men, professionals, and dish it out, I don't see Clarissa Shields being a problem for her. I see her just walking her down, bashing her up. That's what I see. I mean, with Savannah there, I mean, she's probably going to be... She'll not be more than 12 stone, two inch ring. That other woman will be 14 stone. But when you've got somebody 12 stone, two, six foot, with a long reach, whacking your hard, you know, you're talking somebody who does 112 seconds. So it's very explosive fighter. Whacking you, you're going to get hurt, aren't you? You're going to yeah, get and she's, she's fast as well, isn't she? She's got fast punches. So what, I'm quite what that I'm way. Watch for. Yeah, and with that weight as well, the weight uh, disadvantage, she'll be a lot quicker. So yeah. she's a volume puncher, she punches that. hard. She'll knock yeah. her out and win a world title. But we'll get her on here with Belt on Zoom. Yeah, do that. I will. I might go see her in a couple of weeks. She's back in camp now. Peter's got a new gym. And she's back in camp now for a fight, so it's all positive stuff. But... All right then, mate. Well, listen, it's been a pleasure, Rico. Always. We'll do this again soon. It's a we'll uh, lot better on Zoom. Sunday if you want, Rico, or every weekend. Yeah, we'll try to do it every weekend. Why not? All right then. Whilst it's there to do. All okay. right. Well, thank you, all you hardcore boxing fans, for listening to this and keep on trucking. Yeah. Keep supporting boxing. Don't have nightmares. Shout <laughs> out to Johnny Owen at Jab Apparel. Oh, you're all right, Johnny. Send me a tracksuit. <laughs> <laughs> Peace out then, Rico. Take care. Cheers. Bye. Have a good weekend. What's left of it, mate? We'll get some Sunday lunch down here. <laughs> you. See you, pal. See you, mate. Cheers.